according to my ears last night, we're celebrating quite well. Did you all have that too? Somebody around here was celebrating really, really good. Will you join in our first hymn, found on page 720 in the Chalice Hymnal, O Beautiful for Spacious Skies. Please stand.
Peaches, Colorado Peaches and Pears from the Lions Club who will be here. And if you would like to order, please talk with Sandy uh, after the church service and she'll take your order. I think we've all had those before and they're wonderful, so that's something that's coming up. Uh, Linda would like to talk a little bit about the backpack. Good morning. It's so wonderful to see that many eyes looking at you. Um, we have um, finalized with um, the backpack program for our, our school kids. I wasn't here the last two weeks, but I told Laura Jobman we would just commit to what we did last year. Last year was seven, so we're committed for seven. I have five people signed up. So there's still time to sign up. I have some bags that Sandy donated last year. We have three bags left. So if you're interested, um, I'm doing shopping for a few people. So if you need somebody to shop for you or you still want to sign up, it's okay to go half and half with somebody. We've had that done lots of times. So just want to let you know, I'll talk to you later after church back by the corner pew. We'd like to welcome Marcia Spees, the organist today, and her husband, Glenn, who accompanies her, keeps her in line. I know Marcia really well, so thank you, Glenn, for keeping Marcia going. <laughs> Will you join in the call to worship in your bulletin? This is our song, O God of all the nations. A song of peace for lands far and near. This is our prayer, O ruler of all nations. Let your reign come, and, and on, on earth your will be done. Our next hymn is found in the Chalice Hymnal on page 687. In Christ there is no east or west. We confess that we have taken that freedom for granted, 
that we have not actively participated on keeping this country one nation under God. We have allowed the enemy to change our focus and priorities. Forgive us. Heal our nation. Turn our hearts back to you. Deacons prepared to take up the offering this morning. I wanted to share this quote with you. In this life, most of us cannot do great things. But in this life, all of us can do small things with great love. And that's from Mother Teresa. So whatever your offering is, however you give it, weekly, monthly, once a year, when you can, when you can, Important because God takes that and, <coughs> it and brings it back to us so that we responsibly can share the message of God's true love. Will the deacons come forward?
actually several of them, but one in particular that I'm going to read for before we start is actually from Deuteronomy. Now this is after Moses has brought the children from Israel out into, well, they're getting ready to go into the land, the promised land, with Joshua. And God has been with them the whole time. And these are his words. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today, the Lord your God will send you high above all the nations on the earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and your young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your baskets and your kneading troughs will be blessed, and you will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that your enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but flee from you in seven. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put in your hand. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you, and the Lord will establish you as his holy people. As he promised you an oath, if you keep the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him, then all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, the crops of your ground, and the land you swore to your ancestors to give to you. The Lord will open the heavens. The storehouses of his work about you to send rain on your land and season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but you will borrow from them. The Lord will make your head not the tail. Uh, if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day, and turn aside from any of the commands that I give you today, to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. Do not, because if you do, this is the next part. The curse is for disobedience. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God, and do not carefully follow all the commandments and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come on you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your baskets and your needing troughs will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed, and the crops of your lambs, land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks you will be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go up. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to a sudden ruin because of the evil that you have done and forsaking him. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are entering to possess. And the Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever and inflammation, with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew which will plague you until you perish. The sky over your head will be bronze and the ground beneath you iron. And the Lord will turn the rain in your country into dust and powder. And it will come down from the skies until you are destroyed. And here the words from David in Psalms. Psalms chapter 33, 12. But blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. Since the reading. Thanks be to God. All right. I need one more kid come on down. Well, we're going to be talking about what, what's happening. What, what's holidays coming up? Really? Nobody knows. Huh? September? <laughs> Okay, sit down. <laughs> so he's writing your 
story. He's writing all of your stories. Did you know that it's not just your two stories? It's everybody's stories. And it's everybody's story throughout the beginning of time, including the nations. Well, guess what? I have a bag and I have some silks. So it's an empty bag. And we are going to take those. What colors are they? They're blue. You want to stick them in there? They're blue, red, and why don't you shove them in there? Well, it's a blue purple. Okay? So we're going to shake it up. Now, America went through a lot of wars. We went through the Independence War, we went through the Civil War, we went through World War I, II, Korea, and Vietnam, and then Iraq, and then Afghanistan. It's just been back and forth, back and forth. And during that time, those soldiers had many opportunities to have their faith
John Winthrop was one of our founding fathers, and he was a man of God. He had led an entire brigade of people across the ocean that loved God and were in search for a better life and religious freedom. So most people don't realize, they always think that America was founded for religious freedom. That's actually not so much the case because those same pilgrims went to Holland, to the Dutch, and they had all the religious freedom they wanted, but they were persecuted so bad that they were literally starving to death, and they could get no jobs and no food. And so they left Holland, and that's why they journeyed to this new land called America. It was for both religious freedom, but also a better life. Have you ever thought about the fact that one of the largest areas of land, I mean, yes, it was occupied by the Native Americans, but for the most part, it was wide open and waiting for all those thousands of years. We didn't have people come and visit, but it had not been taken over. Every other country overseas had but not America. Why? We are asked a question. I believe that God had prepared this country as an extension for Israel, as a safe place in the 40s when a lot of those Jewish people would need a safe haven to come and land here. And what were we by that time? We were one nation under God. We extended the hand of friendship. As long as we were one nation under God, oh yes, our country saw wars, but we prospered. Did you read what it said in Deuteronomy? It said, if you obey the Lord your God and carefully follow his commands that I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on the earth. What country? For the most part, has the world looked up to recently? Maybe not in the last decade, but recently. It was America. We were the superpower. We were the ones that influenced most of the world. And how did we influence them before? Christianity. They knew that we were a country to be reckoned with. God blessed us. He blessed our homes. He blessed with prosperity. But did you notice what he told Moses before the children left? They'd just been wandering in the desert with him this whole time, following God, minus the hiccup with the golden cow. But what did he tell them? What did he know was going to be the first thing to happen? They were going to see the giants, and they were going to want to run. They were going to come into this land, this promised land that they were giving them, and they were going to see the foreign gods and idols, and that's what they were going to run to, even though they had just spent 40 years in the wilderness with God. Wow, you think, how fickle could they be? And yet, if you've ever read your Old Testament, that's what the Old Testament is all about. Israel coming to God and then leaving God. Or wanting God, but wanting the other stuff too. Let's blend it together. We don't do that anymore, do we? Oh, sure, I'm on fire for Christ, but, you know, <laughs> I should like all that other stuff. <laughs> and we can just incorporate that. We'll, we'll call it good. We'll, we'll have it enough that it becomes tolerable. And then it'll become accepted. Hmm. Yeah, there's a long list of that. I was reading in the Old Testament about some of those times that just blew me away. Because you see, once you have David, and I would even argue, you know, I've been taking the Hebrew uh, class. I'm on my third year now. And, and really diving into Saul, and it is unreal what you find out when you read it through the Hebrew text. Saul was not exactly a follower of God. <laughs> I would argue he didn't really have a relationship with God at all. It isn't until David comes on the scene. And David follows God, and he tells Solomon, he says, whatever you do, he says, do not let your heart turn. Do not run away from God. Do not take a bunch.
bunch of wives. And why did he say don't take a bunch of wives? Because back then you didn't marry for love. You married for what? It was a business transaction with other nations. So if you're now marrying for with other nations, what are you bringing back to Israel? Their gods. Their idols. Their ideas. Their idolatry. Adultery. Everything. All more immorality. So what did Solomon, the wisest man in the world, do? He married 800 wives. And there was one in particular, a Phoenician queen, who brought with her Ashtoreth, Ishtar, Isis, you may know of all these names, Anani. And when she came in, he erected, now this is the same man who built this temple for God on the Temple Mount. He also built a temple for Baal and high poles for Ashtar, right there on the Mount of Olives. So as you're standing, in the middle of Jerusalem, and you look to the east, what would you see of all these temples to foreign gods? This is the wisest man in the world. <laughs> and yet it was influenced by a wife. You keep going throughout all the scriptures, and you get to kings, and, and it talks about all the different ones. And the thing that always killed me was, if you read, it was like, one would do good in the eyes of the Lord, and things would go good, and then the next three would do bad, and everything would go to pot. And then one would do good in the eyes of the Lord, and it'd go good for a while, and then three would do bad, and it would... This was a cycle. One good, three bad. One good. You're like, and this is Israel. If anything, this should have been reversed. It should have been three good and one bad. But it wasn't. You get to the end of First Kings, and you, you see again, we have Israel that split north and south. The king of the north, he wasn't listening to God either, and nothing ended going right in those ten tribes. But the king of the south, he was the king of Judah. He had taken over. He was a descendant of David and Solomon. And he was doing good in the eyes of the Lord, and they were prospering. The king of the north calls on him and says, Hey, come on up. I want to go to war against Gilead. And I want you to come with me. Because he's going, I know God's with you. Come with me so we can win. Now, he knew he should stay put where he was at. But he went anyway. When he gets up there, the king to the north, he's been calling on 300 of his prophets asking, What does the Lord say? Should I go? Should I be victorious? And all 300 said, oh, yes, go. You are going to be mighty, and you're going to win the war, and everything's going to be great. Jehoshaphat. It's up there, and he says, isn't there a man, a real man of God up here? And the king says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this one guy. His name's Malachi. But you don't want to call him because he never prophesies anything good in my direction. Well, maybe it's because your direction wasn't in line with God. But we don't look at that. Jehoshaphat. He says, well, go get him. Malachi comes, <laughs> the soldiers that go and get him, they tell him, tell the king he's going to be victorious in this war. So Malachi stands before the king and he says, you're going to be victorious in the war. But here's the thing, the king of the north, which is Ahab, he looks at him, he's still smart enough, he says, you never told me anything good. He says, I swear to you, you have to make an oath and tell me the truth. Malachi says, it ain't going to be pretty. <laughs> You're going to die. You're all going to be scared. Not good. Jehoshaphat. Going, yep, there it is. Now, you would have thought, you would have thought that at that point, Jehoshaphat would have said, well, been good meeting you, and turned around and gone back home. But he did not. He listens to King Ahab, who's just heard exactly what's going to happen to him, but he is bent on doing what he wants to do. And so they devise the plan and they go to war. What do you think happened? King Ahab gets shot by an arrow. And he doesn't just die immediately, it takes all day long for him to die. And his army is scattered abroad. Jehoshaphat. He does go back home, he does survive. But look how easy it was for him to be enticed. How easy it was for him to drop everything and run with the crowd.
And he should have turned around. He should have known better. He should have tried to talk to the sons of the king Ahab. He should have gone home. I think about this country. That same thing. <laughs> Whether we're split or not split, you know, Jesus had a lot to say about that. A house divided against itself can what? Not stand. Mm. And regardless of what side you're on, or regardless of, of what the issue, whatever, if there's division, you cannot stand, can you? And look how easy it is to run with the crowd. To run with the majority, whether they're right or not. Whether they're taking sound advice, whether they're actually listening to God, or just wanting to go in on their own. I bring this up because this sounds like just Old Testament stuff, doesn't it? I mean, none of that's going on today. This, this is so outdated. When do we even read this book, right? You know, the statistics and the surveys that are taken now, it is unreal. The young people, like I'll even say 20 to 30s, and now especially even the younger kids in school, they can't handle what's going on in the world. And I thought about that. I thought, Yes, it's chaotic and it's horrible and there's things that aren't good, but in the grand scheme of things, for those who lived during World War I and II in Korea, how is today worse? <laughs> but it's a different kind of worse. See, when we were at war before, even in the soul, we were still one nation under who? Under God. We had a foundation. Not only did the country have a foundation, but people had a foundation. They had hope. They had something to stake their life on. Now it kind of seems like shifting sand. It was President Obama who stood up in the lectern and said, we are no longer one nation under God. Things have been shifting since the 60s. We're seeing young adults who do not have that foundation, they do not have anything to hang on to, they do not have hope, and they don't know how to handle life. Things that I never, ever thought would ever come out of my mouth. Because I grew up with a foundation. I grew up with the Word of God. I grew up knowing who to follow and who not to follow. Even if it wasn't the popular thing, trust me. I even stood at the, I was valedictorian in my class, and I had to give a speech. And even in my speech, I said, well, Mom, I said, you know, you, you always said I marched to the beat of a different drummer. Well, I'm here to tell you I marched to a completely different band. <laughs> I actually said that, and I actually quoted scripture. <laughs> Probably was a surprise to you. <laughs> but not too many people were willing to do that. They're not willing to go against the current. Jesus had a lot to say about that. Did he go with the current? Oh, no. He radically went against the current. And who was he going against? He was going against that culture. Who had invaded Israel at that time? Rome. And while the Israelites were trying, the Jewish people were trying to hang on to God. But by a lot of laws. They had been influenced by that culture. By more tantalizing lifestyles. Again, Jesus had a lot to say about that. And he told those 12 disciples, plus all the other ones that followed him, and the one, the apostles that, that came after that, the 350 that were up at the day of ascension, he told them, you need to go against the current, you need to go against the grain. You need to spread the gospel. You need to tell them about a new life. You need to tell them about a foundation that is not shifting sand. You need to tell them about the love of God that when everything is crumbling and going chaotic, and if they feel like they're the only ones around, they need to stand firm because God will not let them go. Tell them that if you follow me, they will be blessed. It doesn't mean that bad things won't happen, but they will be blessed. But woe, woe to the nation turns their back on me. You may be sitting here going, so what can we do? I'm but one person. We are but one congregation. 
We can pray. We can pray and not conform. Be the light. You're not the light yourself. You're not the source. You're the reflection of the light. Be that reflection into this, this community. It starts right here. You know, it used to be that I mean, well, yeah, no, we're a Christian community. And any more Christian state, we're not anymore. We are so far from that. Be a light to your neighbors. Be a light to your kids. Be a light to your grandkids. Be a light to all those that you come in contact with. And let them know that while things may seem chaotic, and it may seem like they don't have anything to grab hold of, we serve a God that says, take my hand. I got you. Keep that in your prayers. As we pray for our nation, we pray for all of those who are in our leadership spots. We pray that God would just continue to put people on our paths that need to hear about that hope. We come to our time of prayer. We're going to keep all that in mind. So good to see Tana here today. Continue to pray for strength. Two more, two more injections. Two more, two more treatments. Connie Neck, I got to see her this week. She's doing good. Double-edged sword. She's excited that she's starting to feel a little better. The bad thing is she knows she has to have the other one done. And not looking forward to that either. So just continue prayers. She has been overwhelmed with love and gratitude by everybody who has just showered gifts and cards on her. Be back your hands Dearly Father, we come before you today and we're remembering all those that are on our hearts and mind, those that are needing your healing touch. We remember those that gave their lives for freedom. We remember those who are suffering or have suffered because of the trauma of battle. We remember the families that are left with a hole at the table because one was lost. We remember the families and everybody that are going to be out on the roads this weekend traveling up through the fort. Even this summer, we ask for safety. Safety and travel safety with the fireworks. Dear Lord, we ask that during this time that you would just press upon our hearts the importance to reflect your light and love. Remind us that we are so blessed to be in a country still where we can call on you as Lord and we can share that word. Don't let us take that for granted. And don't let us stay silent. Thank you for reminding us you're not done writing our story and you're not done writing our nation's story. Just like Nineveh had a second chance, we do too. We pray that you will turn our hearts back to you and that you will heal our land. We thank you for your son who came in the middle of chaos as well. And he was a cornerstone, a solid foundation. And he gave us a prayer that we could pray to you, whether we're worried at home in our beds or we're sitting in a foxhole worried about the shelling. We can always pray this prayer. If you would join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. we come to Christ's feast. We come invited. All who have ex ever accepted Christ and called him their Lord and Savior is invited to this table to partake, to remember. To remember that night in which he sat with his disciples, his chosen twelve, 
that last night he lifted up the loaf and he gave thanks and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is now my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up the cup. As he sat next to the one who was about to betray him, he lifted it up. He gave thanks and he blessed it. And he said, this is now going to be a new covenant. A covenant between myself and you. It's going to be my blood that will be poured out for the forgiveness of all sin. Past present, future. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. So as the body of Christ, we come before the table of Christ, eating and drinking, remembering and celebrating Christ's death, his resurrection, but most importantly, proclaiming to all, he's coming again. If you would join with me in our last hymn, it's on six seven six. Oh, love of God, oh, power of peace.
May you go today in the freedom that we have both in this country and in Christ to share the love and to spread that love with everyone you meet now and forevermore. Amen.